real thank you to Emer and Laura and Ashling for this cooperative effort between the uh, uh, the embassy and, and the consulate on on this on this festival. And to welcome our speakers, uh, Julie from Ottawa, uh, Kelly from UCD, and Chantelle from Dias. And it's a great combination. Uh, University of Ottawa, uh, immersed in, in, in folklore and folklore studies. Um, UCD uh, has had a huge tradition of exploring folklore. Um, and I know that uh, Kelly has taken over the chair uh, some years ago from the great Dottie O'Hogan, who, who was a great researcher into folklore and collecting Irish folklore. Um, and of course, Dias as well with Chantel. And Dias is a really uh, interesting institution uh, that, that combines uh, the uh, study of Celtic origins, uh, ancient Irish manuscripts, and also the cosmos, higher mathematics, and so on. So uh, it's enjoying its 80th anniversary this year. But in some way, Dias is emblematic of Halloween, that combination of, of ancient beliefs and planetary movements, because as you know, Halloween is timed for at the quarter days, uh, those very significant pivot days uh, between uh, the solstices and equinoxes. Um, and Halloween is all about uh, exploring the spiritual world, which seem to be very close to us at Halloween and indeed able to access us. Um, it's also really interesting, and we'll explore this today, uh, how an Irish tradition came with the immigrants uh, to North America um, and was uh, adopted uh, and enriched and in a sense put on, on kind of uh, steroids by Hollywood, uh, gave it a huge global boost and has come back to Ireland in some ways uh, changed and reinvigorated uh, by, by, that, by that very uh, fascinating uh, process. Um, and of course, no Halloween would be complete without a story which Tina will bring to us at the end of this session. So we're looking forward to engaging with you. We hope you learned something new about Halloween. Um, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to say hi to you, and I hope you enjoy uh, this uh, spooky evening uh, with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, just to recap, I think there might have been a slight uh, catch at the at the start with the delay of the live stream. So um, just recap, my name is Emer Friel. I'm coming to you from the Consulate General of Ireland in New York. And this is Laura Finlay, my co-host, who's coming from the Embassy of Ireland in Canada. And this evening is a co-production between the two of us. Um, and we're delighted to bring you this virtual journey through the evolution of Halloween. Um, it's a Halloween like no other, so a good opportunity to explore Halloween from the earliest references right through, through the transatlantic connections that shaped what we have today. Um, at the outset, I want to acknowledge um, Tourism Ireland and the National Museum of Folklife in County Mayo for their input into this evening's event. And we're looking forward to the days when we can all travel again. And hopefully some of you can check out the Halloween festivals that happen in Ireland and see the various creepy objects um, that are in the National Museum in, in Mayo. We do have a fascinating panel in front of us. Before we get into the discussions, just to let you know that there is a live chat box on the um, live stream that you're tuning in from. Um, so do let us know where you're tuning in. And um, if you've got any questions, pop them in there. Laura will bring them to our panel afterwards. Um, as I say, there is a slight delay on the streaming from when, from our conversation. So please don't be shy about your questions. Um, you might, just might miss your chance if you wait too long. Um, and then at the very end, we, we're looking forward to having a presentation of a Halloween story, an original Halloween story. So not one of the ones that we're used to with the ghouls and goblins, but something a bit different. Um, so stay, stay tuned for that. Um, so let me introduce our speakers today. We have uh, three very interesting speakers. Um, we have Chantal Coble, who is the Bergen Fellow at the School of Celtic Studies in the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies in Ireland. And among other things, she's an expert on medieval Irish manuscripts, including legal manuscripts, as well as early and modern Irish language and lectures in Maynooth University as well. We have Dr. Kelly Fitzgerald, who is the head of Irish Folklore and Ethnology in the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore in UCD. She's also on the editorial board or of Bailidges, um, the Journal of Folklore Society of Ireland. She's the chairperson of A New Productions and a director of the National Folklore Foundation. And as well as that, seems to find the time to work on a variety of different oral history initiatives. And um, suitably uh, decked out with a pumpkin in the background, we have Dr. Julie LeBlanc, who's professor of Celtic studies at the University of Ottawa. 
and Julie has a PhD in folklore from Memorial University in Newfoundland, as well as an MPhil in medieval history from um, Trinity College in Dublin, and has a particular interest in traditions associated with the calendar. So we're looking forward to exploring some of those in our conversation today. So maybe um, to kick all things off um, with any good journey, we start at the beginning. So let's start at the beginning. Um, how about we talk about some of the earliest references that we, we find to Samhain or Halloween? Um, I know that they go back in our popular memory, at least in Ireland, to 3000 years ago. But where do we first start seeing um, references and what do they look like and what are, what are they saying? Chantal, I think you might have something that you'd be able to share with us for that. Um, yeah, so the earliest reference to Savin, uh, as we would pronounce it in, or how it would have been pronounced in Old Irish, or Samhain uh, in modern Irish, uh, we find in uh, Cormac's glossary, which is a glossary that dates to the 9th century. Um, and this is kind of, this is explained in folk etymology as consisting of two words, sav and fwin, so the setting of summer. Um, but really we find savin occurring in a wide array of medieval Irish literature. And up on your screen there, you have two images from two different manuscripts. And the manuscript on the left is uh, the one of the copies that we have that contains uh, Echtra Neira, or The Adventures of Neira. Uh, the manuscript is a 14th century manuscript, but the tale itself and the version that we have dates to the 11th century, um, and it's probably an uh, updated version of a 9th century tale, or sorry, 10th century tale. So that the, the earliest references in medieval Irish literature um, that we can date uh, are to the roughly the ninth century. Um, and then you have another copy of a different tale on the right hand side. So they would be the sources uh, in which we find uh, the references to Salvin, the earliest references, Irish references to Salvin or Halloween uh, as it is known today. And um, you, you make a good point there where you mentioned about um, it, the meaning of it being setting of summer. Um, and I know that a lot of what we talk about in, in Halloween is about the moving into the, into the darker period of the year. Uh, Julie, um, maybe you could bring a, bring a thought to, to that seasonal aspect of what, what we mean by Halloween. Uh, yes, actually, if we can uh, see just the uh, colony calendar very quickly. Um, about 2000 years ago, there was this wonderful colony calendar. So we call it the colony calendar because it was actually found in East France in Coligny. Uh, and um, it is written in Latin, but it is essentially is a cycle over um, five years, which is based on a lunar uh, uh, and a solar cycle. And uh, it sets out basically what you're supposed to uh, observe uh, during the course of the year. So what we have with the actual alternate, so if you can look at the slide that actually shows the, the opposites, the polar opposites, the one that's prior. Um, so basically it gives you a standing about 2000 years ago, we know the Gaulish people who um, would have observed at specific times of year, the, the opposites of night and day, the dark half of the moon, the light half of the moon, and the winter and summer cycle, which um, is basically the, the light half and the dark half that we go into. Um, go into the Druidic cycle, I'll be able to show what it actually looks like. Um, so essentially, with the way that it's set up is that during the year, you will actually observe specific uh, rituals or customs that will acknowledge the, uh, the, the events that unfold in the year. Um, and the, the actual slide that shows the Druidic calendar will show what some of the early Druids actually practice. And it makes reference to those, uh, uh, to Samhain. So Samhain would have been observed around November 1st. We have the three nights, All Hallows Eve being on the 31st of October and then November 1st being the Old Saints Day and then Old Souls Day, which is actually November 2nd. Um, which then carries us over into the very dark period of the year, right up to Beltane, which is May 1st, which then is the beginning of the light half of the year into back again, the cycle of Samhain. 
So essentially it's like a, a big pie that you kind of cut up or a barn brack that you like to cut up and, and be able to actually separate it through those particular cycles. And those, those uh, customs that will be observed during the year were considered uh, both sacred and also um, very much akin to the Northern Hemisphere and agricultural practices. So you would collect over the course of your your uh, your reapings from Beltane right up to Samhain, you would make sure that you would have enough foods that would sustain you for the winter months. So the last period to be able to acknowledge all of that will be November 1st going into the dark months and trying to sustain during that time. Fascinating. It's fascinating how it's all connected like that. Um, Ke Kelly, Ju Judy mentions there about, about the seasons and about how, how it's all marked. What Can you maybe tell us a little bit about the early references in folklore and, and, and how that sort of evolved into, into the folklore of, uh, of, of what we're aware of from the, from the early days? Yeah, I suppose, um, I know, um, coming up to much more recent times, um, I know we, we were in our distant medieval earlier past there, um, but we find that particularly when um, there's attention given to this in the 18th, 19th, and, and particularly in the 20th century, that there is still so much importance put at this time of year, you know, that, that not only are we going into the darkness, but at that point of the light going into the dark, um, the other world is much more active in it's a time when divilment can occur and things can happen uh, that wouldn't just happen on an ordinary day. So, so our sense of time and the, how the world works around us itself is changing at this time of year. That's spooky. I think you bring up a really uh, interesting reference there, um, Kelly, and something that maybe in the popular imagination we're, we, we don't always think about because we, we think about Halloween with the world of the living and the world of the dead, but you make a reference there to, to the other world, as in the, the fairies and, and, and things that um, are not necessarily the dead. Right. Um, and I know uh, Chantal and some of the early manuscripts that you mentioned, that's exactly what we're seeing com coming through. It'd be really interesting to hear a bit more about that. Oh yeah, I mean, they could tell a good story. <laughs> um, so I suppose, it, in these medieval Irish stories, um, the Christian authors who composed them, not, not to forget that they were composed by Christians um, in the 9th century, 10th century, 11th, 12th century. And they had, you know, it was written in a Christian context uh, uh, where they were reimagining their past, their pagan past. Um, and they, uh, they drew, I suppose, on classical literature, uh, the Old Testament, and many things. Um, so, you know, it's not uh, to say that it's the same as it was practiced in second century uh, Gaul. But the, I mean, they did have uh, all these tales begun, uh, always set on the eve of Savwin. So automatically the reader or the listener, when they hear these stories go, oh no, something bad's gonna happen. Uh, and uh, so it would be on the eve of Samhain, uh, Log or Cúchollin or whoever goes to the fairy mound and the doorway opens to the other world and he would get to encounter uh, a fairy or the king of the fairies and you know it would either lead to uh, wooing or destruction or death or you know it was so it was it was a literary device that was used by the these authors in composing their tales and uh, I suppose they're so rich it's no surprise that they've continued down through the centuries and become so popular and and are used you know, and kind of evolved and developed into uh, the modern folklore as it is now. I, I'm sure Kelly would be able to expand on that or Julie. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think that brings us nicely into talking about the various different rituals that did emerge as a result, um, where why, why we do what we do today all comes from somewhere. Um, so, I mean, I'm fascinated, for example, we talk about the bonfire and the jack-o'-lanterns. Um, Kelly, I don't know if you want to maybe kick that one off, but I think we, 
everyone would have a little bit to contribute on that. Yes, I think, um, well, I suppose, um, uh, as Julie brought up, it, when we think in a way kind of just focusing uh, at Samhain or, or this time of year, it is taking the full year. And there is always a sense of either sharing fire or keeping fire to, kind of in your possession or how you engage. Is it at home? Are you out? So Halloween is definitely something that is out and about. I mean, we have to remember this is the end of the harvest. Um, as Julie said, we're preparing for you. If you're not prepared for winter at this point, you're screwed essentially for the rest of the year. So it gives you that kind of time. Like if we think of how it functions, it gives the community a time to kind of exhale because they've been working so hard with the harvest. It gives them time to prepare of going into the darkness, which we all know, I mean, here in Dublin, Everyone I've spoken to in the past few days, um, since our clocks have gone back here, the darkness in the evening is already kind of bringing everyone down. Uh, so we, we still feel it, you know, it's how the world works around us. Uh, and uh, we see then um, the kind of imagery of the will, the wisp and, and just, which we now, another term for the jack-o'-lantern and, and that sense of things can happen uh, that uh, wouldn't normally be happening uh, on an average day. And I think so, so, like part of the thing with the fire was bringing that communal fire home to you and that was where the jack-o'-lanterns originally came from. Um, I think we have an image of an old turnip which would have been what they used in Ireland um, there we go. It's a model of an old turnip courtesy of the National Museum, which is pretty creepy looking. Um, and we also are very fortunate to have um, a piece of explanatory um, footage from the National Museum itself, um, which we can have a listen to and, and hear more about what this was all about. So um, that should pop up on our screens in, in just a second, hopefully. And then we have the turnip because the scary lanterns made out of carved turnip and maybe potato faces as well might be kind of also carvings. So the idea of the scary um, lantern, this is the turnip, but it's not a real turnip. It's a model of a ghost turnip from Donegal, from Fintown. Came into the real turnip came into the museum in 1943, and it was given to the curator at the time and said, "This is a turnip for you, but you're not allowed to eat it for your dinner." It came from Sean O'Sullivan in the Irish Folklore Commission, and basically it was given from a woman in Donegal, and she said it was the type of thing that was in Fintown in Donegal that she was used to making in the round. 40 years before, so around 1903. So it's really, really poignant. It's pretty scary and awful. So pre-pumpkins, pre we had the turnips. Um, they do look pretty creepy. Um, I'm not too sure if they, <laughs> if I'd want to meet one of those on a dark night. <laughs> um, but they did so that they, they crossed the Atlantic, that concept crossed the Atlantic. Um, and we, we find we had um, them turned into, into pumpkins. Ju Judy, you're, you're well decked out with a pumpkin there. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about that particular traditional um, evolution, transatlantic connection there? Yes, sure. Um, actually, the interesting part is that turnips aren't that easy to carve. So if anybody has actually had the opportunity to carve them, uh, you'll find that you'll you take a really long time to try and do something that's 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 remotely looks like a face, um, and certainly when the Irish and both Scottish as well arrived over to uh, North America, um, these wonderful things are much easier to carve. <laughs> So gourds and pumpkins, because they, they were just a, a, a native um, um, staple here uh, in North America and were abound, they, they 
grab those instead and started carving those instead of uh, turnips. Um, you don't necessarily carry a pumpkin around though when you go uh, doing your trick-or-treating, but uh, certainly we do light them uh, and they serve the same function as what uh, carving the turnips would have for um, back in Ireland as well, which was to, to give a light to bring back the souls to come back and um, offer them uh, uh, the ones at least that have departed that are part of your family that you wanted to say goodbye to, you would offer some foods and other staples and then uh, recognize basically the, the departed and uh, having a ghoulish face on it would scare away the bad, the bad spirits, the baddies. <laughs> you're, you're, you're segueing nicely into costumes and masks. I mean, where, where did all that come from? Um, um, okay. Well, yeah, maybe Kelly can can add some. So I think yeah. she's got yeah. uh, again. I suppose you have to think of the the whole year. And I know in America we only think of fancy dress for around Halloween. If you're doing fancy dress, it's a Halloween party. But if we think of here in Ireland, how um, this kind of mumming or guising or masking um, starts at this time and it lasts till after Christmas. It could go on into to Bridget's Day as well. But we see it here that whole sense of protecting yourself from the other world. So uh, again, um, so they can't, you know, you can't be discovered uh, um, about that. And I think it's a really interesting thing. Um, Julie and I are both talking, but on the one hand, we're talking about the other world and we're also talking about the world of the dead. And the, uh, the community would have seen those as very, two very separate strands. So you, in a way, the complexities of it here in Ireland is something that perhaps isn't as strong in the States, but the, the definitely the kind of, um, you know, of the souls, the, the, the whole sense of, of um, the kind of more Christian side of this, of, you know, this All Souls Day and all of that is, is very much a part of it as well. So it's a kind of a wild world that can be happening uh, uh, all around us uh, all this week. <laughs> It is. It's a very liminal period right now. So we've got the crossovers that can happen between both worlds. Which it can be both scary, but it can also be a blessing. Um, the uh, the scary bit, as Kelly mentioned, for scaring folks off with your guising, as right up to Christmas. Certainly, when we have Samhain, that kind of marks the beginning of a new year, really. Um, at least for the uh, for 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 early druidic practices and uh, 2000 years later people still kind of recognize that as the beginning of a new year and this is why we have the the um, um, mummering that's also tied to it um, so it's also something that's that's still practiced too in Newfoundland so just a little uh, nudge nudge to uh, folks in the Atlantic <laughs> mummering is something that's still practiced but around Christmas time uh, and actually we have an example of that coming up on our screens there. Um, so this is some mum mumming. Um, I think it's, this is St. Stephen's Day mumming taken from both the or RTE News archives and on the, the right of people's screens, we have the Fingal mummers um, taken from, from St. Stephen's Day. Um, but as, as you're saying there, Kelly, it's something that starts out with, with Halloween, this idea of getting dressed in, in costume and, and moves right, right through to February, all through those dark months. Um, I mean, I'm fascinated with you know, wh why did it all be begin? Like sometimes we, we read stories about it being about tricking the spirits into thinking that they're one of them. And then other times it's about, um, you know, trying to be part of them or, you know, is there any indications in, 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 the, er in the earlier stories as to why people actually get dressed up for Halloween? Um, there, I, there could be, but I'm not aware of... <laughs> I haven't come across any explanation as such, but uh, I think uh, going back to what Kelly and Julie were saying about it spanning over a long period of time that they could dress up in the tales we do have mention of, you know, Halloween, it, it might occur on the eve of Samhain, um, so on the 31st of October, but often the, the festivities start three days before and continue three days after Halloween uh, or they might go on for a whole week so again that concept of of time of it not just being one evening the party goes on for a long time <laughs> um, and at that time you know all the the demons could come out and and it was a, a dark time and a scary time even though it was a time of festivity 
And um, so this idea of it growing dark and it, it was a dark time for people um, at the end of summer, uh, connecting with, you know, concepts of fear and terror as well, uh, is there in the medieval Irish literature. We have some, some examples on screen of, of some masks that were uh, they're in the National Museum. Again, this idea of terror, terror um, homemade masks were, were certainly a thing um, for many years right into our childhoods. But um, we've got some early examples on the screen there um, of how uh, people used to make them. Um, and I think we also have a little clip from the National Museum explaining what these masks are about um, if we have it ready to go. Um, give a bit of background to where they all came from. So we have a wonderful selection of masks, uh, of masks and going around as scary ghosts and some of them you can see this one has sheep's wool on it and like you know making the eyebrows and the moustache, they're, they're mainly male. So yeah then there's the other ones with horse hair, this one's got horse hair on the, um, uh, for the eyebrows and the moustache and they'd be often made from flower bags or dyed you know a bit of cotton but like homemade masks, not the plastic masks so much but of course they come in later and the shop bought replaced places the homemade. What I'd be fascinated to know is um, we've talked about the, the costumes and where they came from in, in, in Ireland, but how did that then emerge in, in the, the transatlantic context and in, in the US and, and Canada? Um, I know that there's Halloween references in the, the 18th century. Kelly, you've talked about those um, in our conversations preparing today. Was that a thing in the 18th, 19th century or is that a later thing? Well, I think, I, I don't know, Julie might know a bit better. I think um, that kind of dress up seems a bit much later. I suppose when we think of the early Halloween, you know, that when we think of the Headless Horseman and we think of just all of that kind of imagery and it fits very well because when we think of kind of culturally New England, um, early Americana, um, just everything was all about, you know, you're going to hell and the very religious world. So it, it took all that on very strongly um, and the kind of imagery of that. But Julie might know the, the kind of progression of the costuming of it all. Um, actually, if we look just more at the performance side of it, it's very carnivalesque in the way that it's, uh, it's displayed. Um, and at certain periods of the year, you actually do um, recognize that. Uh, some of you might, might have seen some Mardi Gras references, not just in Louisiana, but also, um, again, in Newfoundland, they use uh, the term Mardi Gras during the Halloween period. So um, the, the earlier yeah, costuming that you would have probably from a Puritan perspective was seen as a big no-no. <laughs> um, certainly because the, if we look at the root of the performances themselves, and this is something that Rabelais also was, was very, very fascinated with uh, as a 16th century uh, uh, writer. He, he looked at what happened in the Middle Ages and this whole notion of wanting to use a day during the year to actually change things and positions um, that people hold. So flipping authority uh, on its head and having people who are not necessarily seen as being uh, heads of power who now are allowed to be able to ex exercise that. So they would often be wearing different clothing and, and exercising that particular uh, uh, interest. But the idea of that guising part, and certainly when we're looking at mummers, and especially with the masks, and, and those would have been, uh, they would have at least arrived in Canada through that, 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 that um, uh, mummering um, tradition. So we would have seen the, the mostly adults going in to around Christmas time, going to uh, homes and uh, disguising their voices as well. And uh, the, the whole purpose behind it is that there is no gender. You, you're, you're supposed to guess who the person is uh, coming into. And uh, that same root of disguising yourself is something that is very much um, a part of the, the, the root of why we want to change who we are and, and 
scare off the, the bad people and confuse people and create a little bit of mischief as well. So people were doing things that they, they weren't supposed to while they were being dressed <laughs> and unrecognizable. <laughs> it all comes back to the mischief. <laughs> yeah. There's something else that's really interesting, I think, about, about Halloween. And I, I'm, I'd love to hear more about how, it's, how it emerges. Um, and that's going back to what, what uh, I think was Kelly mentioned earlier and the connection with the other world. This was an opportunity to divine the future and that you might be able to tell the future by doing various activities at this time of year. Um, Kelly, have you any insights into that that you could perhaps share with us? Yeah, again, I guess, um, as the Vembrack has been mentioned already, um, but that wouldn't have been the only thing. But yes, so as we're close, as again, you know, the veil between this world and the other world is much closer. So any kind of divination, um, the power of divination would be much stronger at this time of year. So, you know, um, we see it in the Baron Brack. And now I think it just shows we can only be very positive today because there's only the gold ring in the Baron Brack. But there could be a whole kind of categories of futures that one would have. You know, you could you could end up being emigrating. You could end up um, all sorts of things. Uh, you could have ended up as a spinster if you got the um, kind of the... Uh, uh, so I think so again see here's some images um some fabulous photos I do recommend people go on the dukas.ie site where many of the national folklore collection images are that we see here tonight from Morris Curtin and that sense of cutting through there we see the barn brack with the gold ring uh someone's going to get married uh <laughs> with that you know you could get um divination that you may be emigrating at, at various aspects um the barn brack is one way um, I believe um, and Morris Curtin shows another image from Dublin of a girl being blindfolded and showing the various, um, there she is. Again, we see the gold ring on the right hand side. So there were various ways that divination could express itself and people could have a bit of fun with what's gonna happen with their future. We actually um, have a little video, um, courtesy of our friends over at Tourism Ireland, of the Barn Brack and explaining all the different things that you could find in it, um, which might yeah. be fun to have a quick, quick look at. I was going on all the negative ones. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a see and we see which ones are the positive ones as well. <laughs> Take your pick which one of those items you want to get in your in your brack. <laughs> um, that, that kind of brings into, I suppose, the divining brings into the whole idea of, of games. And I know um, I personally, when we were growing up, we used to play bobbing for apples and, and, and various things like that. But where do they come from? And, and, and are they something that we see in the US or did they, did they trans, trans the Atlantic? Those activities for bobbing for apples were actually done also at around uh, uh, birthday parties. <laughs> so um, it's interesting because I, again, the, just to tie it in perfectly with the barn brack, the barn brack is kind of the the uh, the the embodiment of the the last reapings that you get just before you head into that slumber period of the winter. So you've got these wonderful nuts and grains and, and fruits that you've collected and that you dry them up and that you make with wonderful whiskey and tea. Um, and uh, apples also would have been used uh, um, as a, a symbol of, um, of that reaping. So 
it's befitting that they would actually do these types of, of activities that are tied in at that period. But um, some uh, other parts, uh, like in Scotland, for example, if you actually peel an apple and you throw it over your shoulder, the way that the peel lands, if it's a letter in particular that you can make out, that's also a divining of potentially the, the, the person that you're going to end up marrying. So, so those are some of the things that actually did manage to cross over. Um, I don't know if Kelly had some more additional things. To No, no, just I think, uh, again, um, we're seeing, I think that sense of game, um, the importance of game this time of year, I think that comes back to the sense that it's the end of all the hard work of the harvest, and you're preparing for winter. So you're giving yourself the time to come together and play. And on the one hand, you have the games and the divination, but you also have the divilment. I mean, you have the pulling of the cabbages and the pouring of the water down the chimneys. I mean, it could be, the divilment could be quite uh, strong uh, within the community as well. So I think we think of that sense of game and it's a very organized mannerly thing here. Again, look at these fabulous games uh, with the candles, the, the grabbing of the apples and, and don't try the fire one at home. But um, uh, we see here, Again, that sense of play, merriment, um, uh, all of that, and the importance of it as this time of year. And I think we can all appreciate needing a little bit of divilment and fun this time of year. Um, it, absolutely. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, we've talked a bit about so where Halloween was the intersection between the world of the living and the world of the dead and the other world. Um, but today it seems to be as much about witches and ghosts and vampires and goblins and such sorts of things. Um, can anyone enlighten me as to how we got to that point? <laughs> you mean the whole commercialization aspect of it now? <laughs> yeah, how, how, we, how, we, how we evolved into, into co coming away from, you know, being, being sucked into the fairy world, into... Uh, um, into a world where it's about dressing up as witches. And... Well, the, the fact that now it's more of a billion dollar industry and it actually does focus a lot on what you can actually build from it. It's changed drastically in the sense that um, we don't necessarily do some of the things that we would have normally like with the All Saints Day or All Souls Day. It's, it's, it's again within the realm of whoever is in a Christian household would, would, uh, would continue that. Um, but as far as, as the guising and the merriment, it's, it's more of an evolution of how things kind of ended up being. It's all centered around children mostly now. Um, there's lovely little nug um, nuggets of, of uh, fun that are actually found in, in some of the more contemporary films like uh, Hocus Pocus, which actually talks about a child who, who says, you know, the whole idea, we've got the Sanderson sisters that are actually at the bottom here. These are pictures of Salem, um, where uh, you have teens and children who are basically saying that, it, the, you know, the, the, the story of uh, Halloween is actually all invented by the candy company. Um, <laughs> certainly, we actually see the exploitation of it over time. But in places like in Salem, where there's a rich legacy of, uh, of the stories of uh, um, not just women, but also men who were um, prosecuted and, and were executed for, for crimes that were actually supernatural and really it was not the case, but the hysteria of it certainly draws in millions of people to go visit this particular place um, during the whole year. And Salem kind of became this, this, this embodiment of Halloween 365 days a year. Um, and uh, it is very much focused on, on that particular element to try and, and bring in the crowds. But um, again, people really love to get dressed up, to do merriment <laughs> and to celebrate all things that are Halloween, whether it is through the day itself, the week, or even the month of October and even parts of September are very busy in Salem. <laughs> There's certainly a, a different type of dark side, I think, to, to the to the Salem story, and one a one for for conversation in its in its own right, I suspect. Um, just maybe before I know that that there's um, various questions coming in, um, and we, we'll we'll move to those um, shortly. But before we, we do, I, I'd be curious to know: is there um, do you think there is a, still a, a sort of 
a calendar significance to the whole um, occasion now, or is it just something, is it just an excuse to dress up and, and eat more candy? Um, we started out with the calendar. Do, do you think it's still there in, 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 in our modern consciousness? I, I think so. I think a lot of people do like to uh, continue to pay tribute to those who have passed. And even though it might not necessarily be in the way that would have been performed 2000 years ago, um, we do kind of do a little, you know, tip off to those who have passed on. And uh, at the same time, it is that sense of release that happens once a year. Um, you want to be able to have that occasion to be able to get out of your skin literally change yourself and and embody something that's completely different and play be playful with those two parts of the world that are very very liminal so even though they take on a commercialized form I think at the root of it people like to be able to do something like that <laughs> they enjoy it <laughs> Ke Kelly's nodding vigorously oh yeah we absolutely need it this time of year it is that whole uh, again I mean if we didn't have our bank holiday in October we'd be <laughs> dying before Christmas. <laughs> so again, the function, the functions may have changed, but uh, the, the work, you know, again, um, being in the Northern Hemisphere and coming into winter, um, we definitely still feel it. Um, uh, and, and being able to market or do something, I think is still really important for us. Maybe we can blame, blame the pandemic on the fairies. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what they did in the medieval period, you know, in the annals, we get references to uh, the any plague being blamed on otherworldly figures, uh, being told these stories on the eve of Samhain and so on. So maybe, you know, it has a place there <laughs> to help us through these strange times. That to me sounds as, as, as good a thing to, to blame as any. Let's blame it on the fairies. Um, I think it might be a good time to, to hand over to some questions. Um, I'm going to put the baton over to Laura in Ottawa, who has been um, following along to see what people want to ask. So, Laura, over to you. Yep. Great. Thanks, Millie Neymar. And hello, everybody. And um, just welcome for me as well to our events. Great to have you all here tonight. The chat on YouTube has been very active. So there's loads of questions for you all. I'm sure you're very excited. Um, I suppose I just have a question to follow up there with um, Chantelle about what you just said. I absolutely agree. We should blame the pandemic on the fairies. Personally, <laughs> I think we should blame it on whoever dug up a fairy fort because they're the actual person to blame here but um, I was wondering for the people that are watching that wouldn't be too familiar with the sort of tales of the fairies in Ireland like growing up in the west everyone had that one field on their uncle's farm you wouldn't go into that one tree you wouldn't cut down Twitter and Irish Twitter was ablaze this week with some girl that told the story about her father that got lost in his own field and had to turn his coat inside out to get out of the field again and I think maybe some people might be interested in hearing a couple of those sort of uh, tales if you'd be willing to share some? Well, I mean, you're going to hear one at the end of this uh, when Gina will tell the story of Nera, who goes off into the other world. And uh, he <laughs> he goes into the other world and meets an otherworldly woman. Um, and he comes back out and he... When you go into the other world, time is different. So he goes in and he thinks three days and three nights has passed. And when he comes back out and goes to Ali La Maeve on the hill of Kruchen, he, uh, he sees they've all been slaughtered and there's been a big fire uh, and they've been attacked by the fairy people. So they can be quite nasty as well uh, and not just nice. Um, and when he, he, he goes back into the fairy mound, the woman says to him, sure, nothing's happened. That was all just a, a figment of your imagination, but it might become true. Um, you know, so there's a lot of mind games going on as well. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's so many. So yeah, it's one know. of those fascinating elements of Irish culture that we all on one level kind of vaguely believe it but no one really talks about it no one ever admits well, to yeah it. everyone's like I, don't go in that very fort <laughs> yeah so I told my father my daughter not to walk in one the other day uh, in sea point at sea point there was a little <laughs> grass fairy mound so I was like don't. 
That was brilliant. And um, we have people tuning in from Newfoundland, Montreal, Washington, New York, Ottawa, from all over the place. And um, so there's a lot of great questions. So, um, Julie, I might go over to you for one second, just you mentioned the mummers um, in what you were saying. So we have one question in that's uh, from somebody actually in Newfoundland saying that they have Janieing or Janieing there and what's the difference between the two. Um, and yeah, if you could just tell us a little bit about that, please basically the same thing but yes yeah it's it's the uh, idea of uh, getting dressed and then uh, you're changing completely your look nobody can tell who you are and uh normally there's this time of year um when they this not this time but mostly around christmas time they start preparing for processions that they can actually do it's something that wasn't necessarily as active after a terrible event happened in the 19th century but can you just imagine like a person who's completely uh, like you can't tell who it is. They're wearing something that looks like a sack over the head with just holes and, you know, a bunch of things that are over them. And they're knocking at their door and saying, you know, our mummers allowed in um, and you have to basically decide whether you let them in. Normally, the tradition is that you do. And then they normally bring alcohol or people do give them alcohol. And then there's merriment and singing and so on. A lot of mischief making. Um, and uh, you're supposed to guess who it is ultimately before they leave. Um, sometimes just forms of payment. Um, and again, it kind of ties in with something that's similar with the All Souls Day. But essentially, um, those particular actions had been very common. And there was a terrible event that happened, like I said, in the 19th century, which um, basically banned that, 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 that practice. And then it came back. And it, the way that it's been revived is very much within the realm of uh, people wanting to focus on the folklore tradition itself. And so, like I said, with the processions and parades, people really like doing that now. Yeah. And is that um, sort of the same tradition as the Wren boys on Stevens' Day in Ireland? It is. It's similar. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and also I saw some clips too from mummers that were in uh, Fingal that actually come in, they do some songs and then they kind of poke fun at people. Um, they'll be also creating a little bit of a, a, like a, parts of a play that they'll be reenacting uh, and then uh, kind of bidding adieu uh, and wishing well to folks and then uh, off on their way. And yeah, essentially you can't tell who they are. They'll be wearing some straw uh, hats and clothing that kind of shredded and <laughs> very colorful in certain cases, but yes. Mm -hmm. And um, Kelly, um, someone has asked the first literary references of anything resembling our modern celebration, so costumes, turnips, etc., or maybe also to Chantel as well, if one of you be able to speak to that in literature. I think from our modern ones, it, we, it comes in the 18th century and a lot of in kind of English sources in terms of trick or treating, um, what have you. I mean, if anyone please feel free to email me at UCD if anyone wants kind of um, snippets of things, but we have that sense of um, um, geysers um, coming in. And I suppose we haven't really said it, but um, England and that island to the east of us is, is influencing some of this as well. I know we've kind of not really brought that in tonight, but so much of that, even using the term Halloween, all Hallows Eve, we're using the English term for it. So I think um, it, it sometimes gets a, the picture gets a little bit larger when we try and see what sources we bring in to kind of understand all of this that's happening. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, there's been a few bit of back and forth in the chat here about the sort of traditional games you would have grown up with bobbing for apples and all that. And I know when I was grown up, you know, as well as the bobbing for apples, which when you think about it, especially in with a pandemic lens is really, really gross. <laughs> like just as bowl full of your friends spit and you're like, yes, I'm going to bob for apples here now. Um, I think at one point, one of my relatives was also had, a, had us bobbing for coins, which was even worse. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, some of the questions here are asking, how what other traditional games there were and how these games came about as well into the sort of popular um just popular things for people to do with halloween i'm not sure who's the best person to answer that so just uh, shout out there if you have any insight um i don't know what the games were in the medieval irish uh in medieval irish society they just mentioned there was games and drinking and eating um I think there was boasting involved as well. And they'd like have the tongues of their uh, enemies in their little pockets hanging off their belts. And, you know, they'd be talking to each other. Um, but there was always a lot of drinking. 
And so in one tale, in the intoxication of the Ulster men, the, their con cover, the king puts on a big party and he's got like a hundred vats of beer and the Ulster men have to go from one side of the country to one party and then to another party on the other side of the country. So they go to the first party and they get really drunk. And instead of going to the other side of the country, they end up going down to Kerry because they were so drunk. <laughs> so... You know, and then the Kerry men uh, attack them and burn them and all that, but they survive. But you know, there is a sense of humor there. <laughs> uh, the that that role yeah. Putin had to play in the celebration, so I think you've answered that pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I suppose um, just think of there'd be a lot of daring games, you know, daring people to do things like just to get people to build again, as I mentioned, you know, the pouring of water down someone's chimney or pulling up their cabbage. I mean, you would do, you could do some serious damage to people at this time of year, but get away with it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, but that then is you could also be an older history. couple. You could be playing hard. Or even uh, with uh, livestock as well. Um, so folks would uh, try to bring in their livestock because they knew that there was a lot of mischief making. So trying to prevent uh, their livestock from leaving the hills. <laughs> Um, so people would actually have fun playing with gates and so on and um, yeah but just bringing it closer to like divination parts too just about 200 years ago there had been a, a slide that showed some of the postcards and I just want to talk very quickly about that so um, Ellen Clapsaddle was the one that was the um, the artist and she's from New York um, so in the late 19th century she uh, she was known for doing these greeting cards that looked like postcards basically and had a series of them that were also tied in with Halloween amongst other celebrations during the year as well. Um, but these divinations were part of the games as well and part of the the the, the focus was again to try and and hone in on that time during the year where things are very very liminal where you have access to potentially the other world and so it's almost like this clairvoyance part where you're you're going to be playing these games and today we still have people who do this um it's it's part of the stentious behavior where you'll be reenacting a legend that you hear and i know uh, like when we have one particular card where there's a lady who's sitting in, or a girl who's, <laughs> who's in front of a mirror and she has um uh, a candle and she's supposed to basically call on to her future husband but some of you might know about the legend of Bloody Mary. And if you call on to Bloody Mary into the mirror, into the mirror three times, uh, something bad will happen to you. So this type of behavior, these are the games too, that a lot of, um, uh, I would say older children, mostly teens like to be able to, to, to play around Halloween time. Um, and uh, you might see a little bit of mischief making too that's done with adults, but, um, but mostly these are how things kind of progress and change over time, yeah. Brilliant. I'm just looking back through the YouTube stream here. Check I haven't missed too much. Um, somebody asked back at the very beginning um, about the sacrifices that were made on Samhain. Um, specifically, this person has asked if the sacrifices were children or adults. So can you tell us a bit more about the kind of sacrifices that would have taken place? All right. So um, in, uh, in uh, ancient Druidic culture, we're talking about thousands of years ago, um, there were some sacrifices that were actually done and it wasn't done. Uh, it wasn't something that was common in the sense that you didn't do one every single day or every week. Um, there were auspicious times during the year where you could hold these types of sacrifices and only certain people as well would actually be chosen as those that would be sacrificed. So um the idea of actually having children again if you think of two three thousand years ago where the life expectancy was much shorter um it could have been plausible to have those that were very young that could have been chosen uh, they would have had a feast basically leading up to when they would have been sacrificed but there was also a, a rectification in society where if ever there were criminals who had done horrible things the one of the atonements or punishments could be in the form of sacrifice as well so they could have been lopped into the mix too and it was all again in this this notion of uh, like uh, if you're looking at it through a five cycle a five-year cycle lens then it's it's doing it to appease the early gods of Tutatis and Tahanis to to be able to ensure that there's going to be uh, a stability pardon a stability that's going to happen throughout the next five five-year cycle mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, look, can I just point out, yeah, we don't yeah. have any evidence for that here in Ireland, just so mm -hmm. people, 
just I think sometimes we have to be careful that we're, we're, we're covering a very mass time span and a lot of different cultures. So I don't want anyone taking this away tonight thinking that that was that we have any evidence for that here. Just I'm very glad you say that, Kelly. We do have, uh, there is a, a medieval Irish place name tale, uh, the Mag Schlecht Din Hennekes, or the place or the plane of pro, what is it? <laughs> Prostrations. And it talks about human sacrifice but actually that tale is written in the 12th century and it's based on uh, the Old Testament so it's not that they're referring back to uh, 2000 AD in Gaul um, so yeah just to back up Kelly there <laughs> that it's, um, these, the context in which this literature was written was through Christian lens mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's really interesting, especially the way, you know, so many Christian things have been taken from other cultures and calendars changed. We've had a few questions have come in about the sort of date of Halloween. So one of the questions was other countries celebrate Halloween on the 4th of December and they've listed Russia, Turkey, Georgia and Lebanon. And then somebody else has asked if the sort of Mexican Day of the Dead is aligned to Samhain as well. So I don't know who wants to speak to that, but... They, they are actually Dia de los Muertos that would be the one that's uh, celebrated as well closer to Samhain. Um, but the other ones that are in December, I mean, it's very much tied to that end of a year and beginning of a new year. So there are ties to it in that particular uh, degree. So if you can make some linkages there, um, that's normally where we would look how one, one cycle of a year ends and another begins and how we celebrate or recognize it. Great. Um, so we have, sorry, I just want to find it. I saw it pop up there a second ago. Someone is asking about the, the Headless Horseman story and when that came to Ireland and how it became associated with Halloween and what exactly is the myth surrounding it. So I was actually in Sleepy Hollow last year and there was a massive queue the whole way through the city to get into where Ichabod Crane is supposed to be buried and things. So I kind of witnessed firsthand the pervasiveness of that myth. But is is that in Ireland and how did it get there? And could you speak to that a little bit, please? I, I don't know. Is it? In, it could be in Ireland. I mean, now if it's in Ireland, it's because everything has kind of been so globalized. I'd say mm -hmm. people might know. Um, in my own ethnographic work, I haven't come across anyone giving me the Headless Horseman thing. I, I, I apologize. I might have was I was bringing that up more in the North American context. But I don't know, Julie, I don't know. Um, Ichabod in Ireland? No, that's not my domain. No, no, even, <laughs> yes, yeah, no. <laughs> I, I think if anything, if you want to make a, a, some kind of connection, maybe the jack o' lantern story. I think that that's 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 something that could be could be drawn up and would have been an inspiration as well with the, the headless horseman. Just to, you know, if you look at the pumpkin, how perfectly round this one is, it's a good shape of a head. But yes, the jack o' lantern story and the willow of the wisps and the idea of actually having an ember that's given because you had a fellow who tricked the devil. Um, these are both found in continental Europe and also uh, in North America because of immigration, but these stories of tricking the devil are very common. Great. Um, so someone has said, um, my mom, who's a native of County Kilkenny, spoke of going from house to house in her youth to collect coins. Is there a basis for going to neighbours for coins or candy in Irish folklore? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that whole sense i mean I, I suppose that i would like that myth thinking that trick-or-treating only comes from america is is not true so yeah going around and i think that's a whole sense of if we've if we've been looking at the mummy and it's that whole perambulation within the community and visiting and being given little gifts now again when we think of the mummy they do a bit of a performance or they play some music i mean you know, we're in Ireland, you have to do something before they give you money, you know, in America, they just want it. No, I'm just joking. But uh, so we see here, um, so that whole aspect of the mumming and perambulation and visiting the houses and seeing everyone, that definitely is what we're doing with trick-or-treating when we look at it in North America or, or in the UK or where else you're seeing it. So that, that kind of echoing of, of that mumming tradition is coming through. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think for for me anyway, when I was trick or treating as a child, you got coins if the person panicked and didn't have any sweets or anything <laughs> left in your house. But like you know, our costumes were a black sack and a mask from the pound store, and out you go. Like <laughs> none of these fancy costumes. It was a black, black sack. sack. You know. The black sack is the most <laughs> underestimated <laughs> item. It should be in the National Museum. It should be. Put on your black sock now. You're a witch. Congratulations. Out you go trick or treating. <laughs> um so i'm just trying to look through here sorry there's some pictures there on the screen of different kind of costumes um people have worn and then building the bonfire um which i think yeah, and we, and we see these from the goes. rte news archives and, and they are the the kind of plastic masks we think of from the 1970s and 80s up in the top there so yes all of that we look at it now it's all part of our tradition uh For here sure. definitely just far from those spirit of halloween shops we were wearing anyway <laughs> Um, sorry, so someone someone made the comment here, the Headless Horseman was actually a story from the Revolutionary War. It was a Hessian soldier. Um, and now, yeah, a lot of talk, but we're all going to go to Sleepy Hollow next year to check this out more. So we should just all have a big, a big outing there next year. Um, somebody has asked, have we discussed the Banshee and the Puka yet? So would anybody like to speak to the Banshee specifically? We've kind of mentioned the fairies a bit. Uh, Chantel, maybe, would you... I think that's past my date, and maybe Julie and <laughs> Kelly might be. <laughs> being referred to as Puka Night as well is another name for this as as, as well. Julie, yeah, I can speak to the Banshee. Um, uh, so the Banshee, who is the White Fairy, that fairy woman who uh, normally is heard, not seen, uh, to announce the death of somebody in the family. So it is, it is, it can be a very scary thing to hear. Normally there's specific families who have a dedicated uh, clairvoyant or clair hearing person in the family who will hear the Banshee screech uh, and announce as a supernatural death messenger announce the death of a person coming. Um, if ever by chance you do see the Banshee, um, she's described often as this very ghostly, ghastly white figure, very long white hair, combing her hair and sometimes seeing crying tears of blood, which is a reference actually to early Keating uh, traditions where there was self-mutilation scratching at your face while you were lamenting the dead. So that that figure itself, and I remember Laura, you and I talked a little bit about the Banshee and how she was depicted in Darby O'Gill. <laughs> she can be a frightening figure to see for sure, but the screech was just as alarming. Mm -hmm. I think I was way too young, even though Darby O'Gill and the People is a children's movie. I think I was still too young to watch it because to this day, at the age of 32, I am still terrified of that banshee. <laughs> um, uh, just seeing here now. Uh, so some, someone here has commented that they'd make a paste of flour and let it dry on their face with a sheet over their bodies and that would be their costume, which is still fancier than a black sack in fairness. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just a bit more talk about CP Hollow. So everyone that's watching, if you have any questions, you can ask them now, um, because we'll probably wind up questions soon, so get them in now. And I suppose one other question people have asked until now is gate night, when people make mischief the night before Halloween, an Irish tradition. So I don't know, is anyone, I hadn't heard of that before now, but if anyone on the panel is able to speak to that, anyone? No. Um, so we, we'll look that up and come back to you at a later point. Uh, someone else commented about Baron Brack after watching that video that it's like the war games and the only way to win is not play, which I think having seen that video is solid advice because the Baron Brack I had growing up just had the ring in it. I didn't realize how much your life could be ruined by having a slice of cake. <laughs> I know it is. When you get that bit of stick, you're going to have a bad marriage. It's just like it's pro like you're going to be beaten. I mean, it's it goes dark. You got to always remember an Irish tradition. However good it gets, there is absolute balance of the dark side of it as well <laughs> can you imagine being really young and you get that stick and it's like oh well i better give up now then <laughs> um yeah i think those are those are the main questions um that have come in people are agreeing that the banshee is absolutely terrifying in derby Gill, so i feel quite vindicated right now um so yeah i think if if there's no one else we might get on to our spooky tale which i'm very excited for um, so this is a story, like Chantelle has already mentioned, um, The Adventures of Nera, which is a medieval Irish tale that survived, survives in three manuscripts and dates back to the 11th century. The tale takes place on the eve of Samhain and relates to the adventures of Nera to and from the other world. 
So we're very lucky tonight to be joined by Gina Costigan, who's a Dublin-born actress who moved to New York in 2013. In Ireland, she played the national soap uh, opera Fair City and films such as Veronica Gear and Becoming Jane and The Frontline. In New York, she's appeared on Broadway in The Ferryman, um, off-Broadway at the Irish Rep, the Mint Theatre and New York City Centre and on screen as the marvellous Mrs. Maisel. I know this much is true when Brittany runs a marathon. So very impressively, um, she's recently been cast alongside Ewan McGregor in the upcoming series Halston. So we're delighted to have her with us tonight. So Gina, I'll hand over to you. It was Halloween and King Al and Queen Maeve of Connacht were feasting with their whole household in Fort Cruelcon. On the gallows outside hung two captives that they had executed the previous day. The king said, whoever can tie a willow branch around the foot of one of the captives shall have any prize from me that they want. It was an especially dark and horror filled night. Demons would always appear on that night. Each man went out and turned to try, but quickly came back in. I will win the prize, said Nera, and donned his armour. He went out and put a chain around the foot of one of the two corpses, but three times it sprang off again. Then the captive told him that he needed to put a proper peg in it, which Nera did. The other captive looked down from the gallows to Nera. That is manly, Nera. I appeal to your valour. Please bring me to get a drink. I was very thirsty when I was hanged. Come on then, said Nera, and put him on his back. They went to the nearest house, which had a lake of fire around it. There is no drink for us in this house, said the captain, for they have used all their water to dampen the fire. They went to the next nearest house, but there was a lake of water around it. And do not go to that house, said the captive. They have thrown out all of their water. Then they went to the third nearest house. Nera put the captive down on the floor. There were tubs for washing and bathing in the house and a slop pail on the floor. The captive took a drink from each pail and scattered the last sip from his lips at the faces of the people that were in the house so that they all died. Henceforth, we know that before sleeping, we should always dampen down the empty fire and empty our washing and bathing tubs and our slop pail. Then Nera carried the captive back to the gallows and he returned to Cruelcon. But he saw that the fort was burnt and its people had all been beheaded by a host of warriors from the fairy mound. He went into the cave of Cruacon and followed the host to the fairy mound. The heads were displayed to the fairy king. The king asked to speak to Nera and said to him, go over to that house. There is a single woman there who will make you welcome. Tell her I sent you and come every day to this house with a burden of firewood. He did as he was told. The woman bade him welcome. Every day Nera used to go with a burden of firewood to the fort. What appeared to you? asked the woman. I thought the Cruelcon fort had been destroyed and Al and Maeve and their whole household had perished. That is not true, said the woman. But an elfin host came to you. It will come true, she said, unless you reveal it to your friends. Well, how will I warn them, asked Nera. Rise and go to them, said she. They are still around the same cauldron and the fire has not yet been put out. Yet it had seemed to him three days and three nights since he had been in the fairy mind. Tell them to be in their guard next Halloween, for I will promise them this. The fairy mound will be destroyed by Alil and Maeve and the crown of Bruin will be carried off by them. How will I prove to them that I went into the fairy mound, said Nera. Take some fruits of summer with you, said the woman. So he took wild garlic with him and primrose and buttercup. And I will be pregnant by you, she said, and I will bear you a son. Oh, and send a message to the fairy mound when your people are going to destroy it so you might save your family and your cattle. Then Nero went to his people and found them around the same cauldron and he told them about his adventures. He was given the king's gold sword as a prize and he stayed with his people till the end of the year. Then Nero went to his wife in the fairy mound and she bade him welcome. Go out to the fort now, said the woman to Nero, and take a burden of firewood with you. I have gone to it for a whole year with a burden of firewood on my back every day in your stead. And I said you were in sickness. And there is also your son yonder. Then he went out to the fort carrying a burden of firewood with him. Welcome alive from the sickness in which you were, said the king. Nero went back to his house. Rise out now, lest your warriors come, his wife said. 
This host will come on Halloween next, for the fairy mounds of Erin are always opened about Halloween. Nero went to his people. Well, where have you been, said Alala Maeve to Nero. I was in fair land, said Nero, with great treasures and precious things, with plenty of garments and food. They will come to slay you on Halloween coming, unless it has been revealed to you. Well, we, we certainly shall go against them, said Alal. So they remained there till the end of the year. Now, if, if you've anything in the fairy mound, said Alal to Nero, bring it away. So Nero went on the third day before Halloween and brought his drove out. Thereafter, the men of Connacht went into the fairy mound and destroyed it and took out what was there in it. And then they brought away the crown of Bruin. Nero remained with his people in the fairy mound and has not come out until now, nor will he come till doom. Thank you, Gina. There you have an original Halloween story. And we're so privileged to have Gina join us. And we're also really grateful to Siobhan McNamara, the literary translator based in Dublin who helped us by adapting that story from its original translation from Old Irish into English. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of our panel discussion. Um, it remains for me to thank everybody, to thank our wonderful panelists for what was really a, a thought provoking and fascinating journey through the evolution of Halloween. Your time and your expertise um, was shared with us so generously. So thank you so much for that. I think we will all see uh, the festival of Halloween in a, in a different way after, after that particular conversation. Um, and I want to thank everyone who joined in to follow this event on, on YouTube, Tube and who got involved with questions and comments and sharing their own experiences that they recall from the way that they have celebrated and marked Halloween over the years. Um, there were some references during the course of our questions and answers to some of the RTE archives footage. And if anybody wants to have trips down memory lane, there's plenty there to, to uh, explore from the, the kids talking about the pranks that they used to play um, to the mummers dancing on the streets, to people dressed up in costumes and the bonfires. So um, head on over to RTE to check it out. And again, thank you also to the National Archives and to um, sorry, to the National Museum and to Tourism Ireland for, for their contributions. Um, I want to thank the support teams here in the uh, Consulate General of Ireland in New York and the Embassy of Canada in, Embassy of Ireland in Canada, and particularly to Ashley McGinley, who um, put a lot of work in behind the scenes um, for this particular event this evening. So it remains to say from Laura and from me, however you mark your Halloween, stay safe from ghouls, Stay safe from fairies, but most of all, stay safe from the virus. We let Tourism Ireland take us out with a little clip reminding us about Ireland as the home of Halloween. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>